He's a very calculating man. He likes to choose conflicts which he thinks he can win and to do things that he thinks he has a reasonable chance of getting away with. Uh, Philip Shaw, thanks very much indeed for being with us. Look, I believe eight years of research has gone into this book. Can I congratulate you on understanding Putin so well that you knew exactly the best time to publish uh, with, with all the, everything that's been going on in the news? How much did you have to add or rewrite after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February? Very little. Uh, because um, I won't say it was predictable. He's extremely good at doing things which were which are unpredictable, which uh, everybody says, well, actually, Putin's never really going to do that. It's not the first time he's acted in that sort of way, um, though it's the most dramatic occasion. Um, so it 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 didn't come out of the blue. It didn't come as an aberration. Uh, it was consistent with everything he's done over the last 20 years or so. It's been kind of an incremental process of deepening hostility with the West, of deepening repression at home. And it's, it's led to this, uh, which you can interpret on many ways. I mean, you can see it as a, a war to bring Ukraine back to the Russian fold, as Putin would see it, uh, uh, to bring Ukraine to heel. You can see it as a conflict essentially between Russia and the United States. Putin trying to in, f force the United States to take into account Russian sensitivities, Russian concerns, Russian interests. And at a, yet another level, you can see it as a conflict between China and America, a proxy conflict with China using Russia and the United States using Ukraine. So, I mean, from those answers, it seems you wouldn't necessarily see Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine as being a specifically Putin-driven thing, a thing driven by, the, by, the, by the, the personality and obsessions of the man. Is that fair? Well, it is Putin-driven in the sense that everything in Russia is Putin-driven. Uh, this idea that he's, uh, you know, got an entourage which is capable of manipulating him is 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 really way off beam. He is the final decision maker, and I think you're right. I mean, I think it's fair enough. Had there been a, a different leader in power, uh, this might not have happened. Uh, it might, um, but. You're talking about Putin as an individual. You're talking about Russia as a country. And they are not so far apart as perhaps we wish to think. Putin is there where he is. He has the support that he has. And even now, he has really very considerable support because he, for many Russians, he in, is the incarnation of their aspirations of what they regard the Russian state should be, strong, not subservient to the West and forging its own path. That's that's not just a Putin thing; it's a very Russian thing. Okay, uh, we have a bit of a delay on the line, but let's let's see how we get on. Um, during this interview, I want to play you a couple of clips from recent interviews we've done on this show. Uh, this one coming up is from Marina Litvinenko, wife to Alexander, who was killed by radioactive polonium uh, twenty uh, polonium two ten poisoning in London. Uh, she sees a through line from that to what is happening now. Have a listen. When it all happened in 2006, reaction was so weak. Mm -hmm. And for Putin's regime, for these people, it was like an obvious evidence you are, can't do anything mm -hmm. because you are became depending from oil and gas, what we provided to Europe, and you depending from many other things. And what even worse, influence of Russian to British society became very strong mm -hmm. after UK accepted Russian money. Yeah. Not simple a business money, a lot of money. And all this what happened in 2006 with my husband. After that was another uh, war in Georgia. What was the reaction? Very strong. Not 2014 invasion in Ukraine. And for what happened with Crimea. And again, quite soft reaction. Some sanctions, but everybody still lived the same life. 2018. And now we have 2022, and we are now all involved. So that was Marina Litvinenko speaking on this show uh, a, a couple of months ago. Um, uh, have weak Western responses to the killing of Litvinenko and the attack on the Skripals and previous Putin military expeditions enabled this war in Ukraine, would you say, or not? No, I think that's simplistic. Um, th she's absolutely right when she says that uh, we didn't react particularly strongly. Uh, we didn't. Um, but Putin chose his his victims. 
both at the personal level, people like Litvinenko, and the conflicts in Georgia and in Ukraine in 2014 quite carefully. Um, he's a very calculating man. He likes to choose conflicts which he thinks he can win and to do things that he thinks he has a reasonable chance of getting away with. Uh, he, he's not somebody who would, who would launch a war. And I think this is true of Ukraine today as well, if he doesn't think that there is a chance that he can get what he wants out of it. If he doesn't think in the case of what we're seeing now, that the West will eventually tire, that inflation in the West energy shortages, hunger in the third world, possibly setting, up, setting off new waves of migration, which will go down extremely badly in Europe and cause enormous problems. All those things he's, he's built into the calculation. It's not just about what's happening on the ground in Ukraine. You know, so uh, yes, um, the, the lack of reaction, the fact that he got away with things earlier, um, that has been a factor. But I don't, I don't think you can, you can connect the dots quite that easily. Um, it's a bit simplistic. Um, one of the things that made Litvinenko an enemy of Putin was that he co-authored a book about the Russian apartment bombings in 1999, uh, saying that they were a false flag operation guided by the Russian FS, uh, FSB to justify the Second Chechen War. Uh, but in, in your view, that, that's not correct. That didn't happen, right? It doesn't stand up. If you look at if you look at those allegations very closely, I mean Litvinenko had an agenda. Um, nothing excuses the way he was he was murdered, which was brutal and which was personally approved by Putin. There's no question of that. Um, but Litvinenko had an agenda. He was backed by Boris Berezovsky, uh, who had an agenda, who was violently hostile to Putin and wanted to bring him down. And they made a case by uh, choosing the evidence very selectively. Now, if you really analyze that evidence forensically, it doesn't stand up. A lot of it's simply wrong. A lot of it doesn't add up. Um, there is no, I mean, one of, one of the things which struck me most, I talked to two former heads of the SIS, Richard Dearlove and John Scarlett, and I talked to the CIA station chief in Moscow, and they were all adamant. They'd seen nothing which was remotely convincing that this had been done as a false flag operation. And had it been done, all three of them said, it would have leaked. Mm. These things do leak. Uh, they, you, you can't keep them completely under wraps. And it hasn't leaked. Now, I give rather more weight to two heads of the SIS of MI6 and a CIA station chief who was in Moscow at the time. Uh, than to speculation, which is on closer examination, not not sustainable, not supportable. Mm. Sure. I mean, tell us a bit about the kind of people you spoke for this book, other than the people you, you mentioned, because the book the book doesn't use anonymous sources, which is admirable from a journalistic point of view. But does that skew the kind of information you receive from your interviewees? Do people talk candidly? Uh, does it limit your ability to get to sort of real real Putin insiders? I don't think it does. Um, I think it's very important to have named sources who are prepared to stand by what they say, because the trouble with all these books, and there have been many, many of them with anonymous sources, is that there's no way of verifying it. Um, it may be true, it may not. A lot of it is hearsay uh, from people who believe what, what they're reporting, and at second and third hand, it gets into the book. But it's it's there's no way of really pinning it down and relying on it. Um, if you talk to enough people, you find actually the same things coming up again and again from Russians, from Scandinavians, from Finns, from diplomats, from heads of state who've dealt with Putin. Um, you can triangulate and you figure out very quickly what, what's not plausible, what's coming out of left field and you can ignore it and what actually figures because it's in many people's experience in one way or another. And I, I think the picture that emerges from two things, from all these interviews, and we're talking about a couple of hundred interviews in a dozen different countries, uh, of all, all of them, of people who've known and dealt with Putin professionally or who were friends of his early on in his career, and now maybe are not friends at all, are distinctly hostile. Um, uh, that, that is one key source. The other are Putin's own words and his contradictions and his lies.